<laughs> All right. Is it on? Okay. Are we all filtering in? You can go get critical mass. Yeah. All right. Excellent. Well, I hope you all had a good lunch and had a good continued conversation after our morning session. Thank you to the morning speakers and other panelists for, I think it's been a great conversation so far. I hope you feel as inspired as I do to take this information and do some stuff with it. So that's the plan. Whatever that stuff may be, we're going to figure that out this afternoon. Um, but before then, it is my honor to introduce our featured speaker for the day, Dr. Dion Hoskins-Brown. Dr. Hoskins-Brown is a NOAA research fisheries biologist who was assigned by the National Marine Fisheries Service to develop a cooperative program at Savannah State University in 1999 with a Bachelor of Science in Marine Biology from SSU and a PhD in Marine Sciences from University of South Carolina. Me too. Uh, she was the first SSU graduate to return with a doctorate and serve on the program's faculty. When she returned to SSU, her mission was to educate and train the next generation of marine scientists. She's done this by administering NOAA-funded student research training programs while researching essential fisheries habitat like salt marsh and oyster reefs and import important commercial species like white shrimp and blue crabs. Her leadership has positioned the SSU Marine Science Program as the leading program in the country for graduating African-American marine scientists. Her long-term research on fish habitat and passion for African-American history on the coast led her to document the stories of Gullah Geechee fishing families in Georgia, resulting in the African-American Fisherman Oral History Project. This work led to her appointment on the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor Commission, where she currently serves as the chairperson. Her dedication to youth led her to start the SSU Coast Camp, a month-long half-day camp to teach ocean literacy to youth aged 7 to 18 years old. In addition, she currently serves as the chair of the Accountability Committee and the vice president of the Savannah-Chatham County Board of Public Education. She's received multiple honors for her mentoring and leadership roles, including the Emmeline Moore Prize in 2016, an honor bestowed by the American Fisheries Society uh, for distinguished efforts to increase diversity in fisheries. She continues to be active in the Savannah community through her volunteer work and service on boards related to marine education and environmental leadership. Uh, today she'll speak to us on the intersection of nature and culture in the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor. I will say that we actually abbreviated this bio a little bit. Uh, she's amazing. The full bio is on our website if you would like to learn even more about her. Um, but now I'll turn on the floor over to you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lynn. Yeah. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Wow, I haven't said a word yet. And you know when you get a when you get an um, an introduction like that, I'm like oh, I wish my mom was here. She loves hearing that stuff. <laughs> Moms love that. Um, I am very very happy to be here on multiple levels. Um, one because uh, we're we're talking about something and we're trying to do something that integrates uh, the different thoughts that I have in my head. Um, and, and also because I've recently started working with the Nature Conservancy uh, in Georgia. In fact, this is a Nature Conservancy week yesterday. Uh, we were at a field site uh, in Darien, Georgia, looking at a culvert that is used a lot uh, for kayaking and trying to find ways to improve that and work with private partners. So yesterday I had on like bug clothes and was there, and today I'm here supporting TNC in, a, in another way, and I'm very, very, very um, grateful. So what I'm going to talk about today is going to be kind of the manifestation of a conversation I've been having with myself in my head. So I'm very hopeful that it makes sense to you all because it sounds good to me. Okay, so I'm hoping that it will be informative, and I also want to bring some examples of some of the things that I've participated in in the past that I think inform what you're trying to accomplish today. I'm going to start with some background on the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor. And uh, for some of you, this may be complete review. For some, it may be um, brand new information. But the corridor is a national heritage area under the Park Service. Uh, and it was created under a congressional mandate. And it recognizes the unique culture of Gullah Geechee people, those individuals who resided in the coastal areas between Wilmington, North Carolina, and St. Augustine, Florida. So this is a timeline from no corridor 
to a corridor until 2037. Uh, it started as, a, as an idea, and it was first mentioned in an Appropriations Act in 2000. Our cheerleader for this effort has been uh, Representative James Clyburn, uh, and this was something that he was seeking to accomplish for a very long time. And so the first thing before you get a national heritage area is you have to perform a study to find out should there be a national heritage area. And that, that study was commissioned in 2006, generated a special resource report, which is 300 pages. This is the copy of the report that's available on the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor webpage. It's a very, very rich source. If you know zero about Gullah Geechee culture, it's a very academic as well as grassroots treatment uh, of the content with lots of resources at the back. So that was used to substantiate the need for a national heritage area. Uh, it then was approved with the, with the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Act which then necessitated a management plan um, that I'll mention a little bit later. It was renewed in 2016. It was resubmitted and approved for reauthorization just this year and has been extended to uh, 2037. And what you'll see is there's been a change in how Gullah Geechee has been written in the act. Now it is, it's no longer in the management plan. The slash was removed, and this was prior to me joining the commission. The slash often means either or. And so they changed it, the, the previous commission, to hyphenated, to be inclusive. And then they decided that it was really more contiguous in 2012. So you'll see the commission writing it in that way. <clears throat> so Gullah or Geechee. Anyone recognize this book cover? I see, I see one hand. This is the book cover of God, Dr. Buzzard, and the Bolito Man. It was written by Ms. Cornelia Walker Bailey. Absolutely extraordinarily woman, extraordinary woman. We lost her a few years ago. And she talked about growing up on Saplow Island, Georgia. Uh, and there she referred to herself as Geechee. And in this quote, she's saying how they just thought the people who spoke Gullah talked too slow. Um, and that was the distinction that they made uh, between the two. I'll refer to this, this, her book again for some other essential information that's relevant to how Gullah Geechee people intersect with nature. In terms of the use of Gullah or Geechee, academics are not completely in agreement for where those terms come from. Uh, typically, Gullah people have been referred to those living in Florida and South Carolina. And I grew up in Savannah, Georgia. I had no knowledge of this. And when I was growing up, everybody was Geechee or not Geechee. Um, and Geechee was North Carolina and Georgia. Um, I didn't realize that it jumped South Carolina. Um, but Geechee people in Georgia will refer to themselves mainland or saltwater if they use a term at all. And you have to know that it was extremely derogatory to be called Geechee or Gullah for most of this generation. Those who are silent generation, those who are in their, you know, late 70s, 80s, those who are baby boomers were dissuaded from speaking with the accent, were dissuaded from, if you called somebody that in the schoolyard, you're about to be in a fight. So this identity, this, this cultural pride around these terms is, uh, pretty, is relatively contemporary. And if you want to hear more description of that, you can hear Cornelia Walker Bailey's description of growing up on Saplo. Or if you've not read uh, Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas's autobiography, My Grandfather's Son, you'll hear how he talks about um, going to Catholic school and having uh, the, having the um, accent highly dissuaded. So in some circumstances, the term Geechee has been used as a blanket term to describe people in the low country. Let's just say that Gullah Geechee culture was created when you had this amalgam of people coming from different places in Africa being dumped in one place to work together, to convene together, to live together, but who had different practices, traditions, religious, and cultural beliefs. And it is that creolization of culture that created Gullah Geechee culture. So the idea of Gullah Geechee um, as its own language, um, raise your hand if you've heard of Lorenzo Dow Turner. Awesome. This is going to be great then. I'm sharing all kinds of new stuff. So Lorenzo Dow Turner was a professor who taught summer courses at South Carolina State in Orangeburg. Um, and he was teaching the summer course one year. 
and noticed a distinct accent in students who were from the South Carolina Low Country. Um, he didn't, um, he understood it, and he also understood that this accent was not affecting their, um, their, um, their schoolwork. They were extraordinary students. They knew exactly what they were doing. They were high performers, but they spoke in this different dialect that he didn't recognize and that appeared to be broken. And so he kind of went to the kids and said, hey, you know, where are you from? You know, and as he learned where they were from, he started going to those communities and asking questions and learning more about the language. He moved to Georgia for 14 months and recorded voices in families in coastal Georgia, most notably uh, Harris Neck, Georgia, uh, where the first recording of Amelia Dolly was later connected to the Mende culture uh, in Africa um, through a um, baby's lullaby that Amelia Dolly sang to her uh, daughter, granddaughter, Mary Moran. So none of this was known when he was doing his work. So after he did his field studies in coastal Georgia, Georgia and South Carolina, he continued to do work in coastal Africa and wrote the book that he called Africanisms in Gullah Dialect. And through that work, what he showed was that you cannot account for the origins of the Gullah Dialect without accounting for the languages of the enslaved who came from Africa. So that is the quick overview of Gullah Geechee culture for those who may be um, unaware. I want to opine that Gullah Geechee culture is nature-based, and I'm going to make a series of statements like this that I plan to support. So this is the conversation I've been having in my head, is that all these things are true, and these are the things that make me think it, and I want you to also agree with me. So, toward nature-based solutions, we should acknowledge a Gullah Geechee legacy that embraced nature for self-care. This is the woolly Moline, and this is a plant that Ms. Walker Bailey referred to in her autobiography as one that would be used to soothe pain um, as a poultice. And she, when she referred to what we now call local ecological knowledge, they used to call traditional ecological knowledge, but traditional ecological knowledge, I used it once and an anthropologist kind of smacked my hand and said, stop that, don't say that. Because traditional makes it sound static. Like it never changed and it's something that you believe in that you don't change. Local means I'm on the ground and I know this stuff and my literacy may be evolving as I'm in this place. And so I was told, don't use that. So I'm just, take that. You get, it's, it's what you paid for. It's worth what you paid for. So what she would say is that the old people knew the secrets of roots and herbs. We had roots and herbs all over Sapelo, and we used them for everything. My first exposure to home remedies in Gullah Geechee culture was when my sister gave me this book by the late Verda Mae Grubsner. Some of you may remember her having a PBS book, a PBS television show, Verda Mae Cooks um, in the Americas. Extraordinarily good cooking. But this book, I was a grad student, I was broke, and my sister was also a grad student at University of Michigan, and she found this book at the bookstore up there, and it was the first autobiographical cookbook I had ever read. Has anybody ever read an autobiographical cookbook? They're so awesome. They really are. If you don't like, I'm not a cookbook reader. My sister's a cookbook reader. She's a foodie. She'll just read it because she wants to read recipes. That's not me. I need a story. I need people. I need places. And in this particular book, it really is what she's saying. It's, it's travel notes of a Geechee girl. And she talks about, on Wednesdays, we used to do laundry, and my grandmother would make lye soap. And then right there in the narrative would be the recipe and the instructions for lye soap. And then when the recipe was over, then she'd pick up the next part of the narrative and you'd learn more about her life. So I was making lye soap. But there's a whole chapter on home remedies and this idea of nature-based solutions um, by Gullah Geechee people. Same is true for Ms. Walker Bailey's book. Um, and most notable, you'll hear people talk about life, everlast life everlasting, which is prohibited, but people still use it. And, um, still find it effective. But this whole idea is that there are nature-based solutions for self-care and what ails you. 
The other thing I want you to believe is that Gullah Geechee communities are nature-based because environmental literacy is a core value. It's a core value at home, and it's a core value in the community. We know that ecological knowledge predates emancipation because individuals who were enslaved were selected for where they were and what they knew there so they could bring it here and benefit those who were trying to make their knowledge a commodity. We know that, and we know it particularly with rice. We also know that after the Civil War, many of the education centers that were set up were set up around agriculture and other nature-based professions. Um, here you see images from the Penn Center website. One is of students making sweetgrass baskets, uh, and the other is young people learning um, some planting techniques. This is the same in, in Georgia, in, uh, in Savannah. We have a school, a school called Haven Home, and Haven Home is now in the middle of Savannah, but at the time, well, it's not there anymore. Now it's Bartlett uh, STEM School, so STEM Middle School. But that site would have been way, way out in the sticks at the time that it was established. And the majority of families were farming families whose children came to Haven Home to learn better techniques to help with their success. When I started the um, oral history project, I interviewed uh, a number of individuals. And they, were opening, they weren't interviews. They were oral histories. Because I would say, tell me about your life. Tell me about your engagement with the water. How did your family engage with the water or the land? And then they would tell me. And one of the answers I got was from Mr. Charles Hall, very digni dignified, very successful uh, man who had a number of um, successful physical therapy businesses in the Midwest and maintained his property on Sapelo Island and was president of the Sapelo Island Cultural and Revitalization Society at the time. Um, and uh, he sat down with me. And I asked him, I said, OK, tell me about fish. Did you fish? How did you fish? What did you catch? Um, and he told me those things. But then he said, well, we caught everything. But what's important to know is that at that time on Saplo, again, this is, bless you, this is a member, of our, a member of our silent generation. He said, part of your ability to survive was preserving what you caught, because you didn't have refrigeration. So you had to be very literate on how to get what you needed, how to get what would sustain you, um, and how to preserve it. When you listen to families talk about fishing, hunting, um, farming, you don't hear, and, and maybe occasionally you do, but what I did not hear in the Oral History Project was this romantic kind of infatuation with the environment that was purely aesthetic. Oh, I just like to look out over the trees. It was more a hearty, deep respect of this is what the environment provides to us, and this is how we respect and take care of the environment. These were stewards and conservationists, and this is a good interview. I'm not going to play the interview, um, but it, it tickles me. The interview is asking some innocent questions, some of them kind of stupid questions. So you listen to him asking these questions, and I just love to see seniors kind of stomach a dumb question and kind of keep going. <laughs> Um, but what you listen to in his voice is he's telling you a very matter-of-fact way of them farming and engaging with the environment. And one of them was about growing rice, and you know they didn't grow rice anymore. It was labor-intensive, and you, you didn't really need to grow rice anymore. But all of this is, is imparting to me that there's a literacy there in the community. Gullah Geechee communities are nature-based because they have a sustainable green value system. You take what you need. You don't take anything else. Um, you're not meant to be able to read this. I just took a screen capture of the Georgia um, portion, the Georgia Black Fisherman portion. And these are the interviews and the transcripts, the recordings of the individuals that I spoke with. Um, I spoke with and my postdoc, uh, Jovan Therese, spoke with roughly between 2009 and 2012. 
Um, and so if you go to Voices, it used to be called Voices from the Fisheries, now it's just called Voices. And there are voices from all parts of the fisheries throughout the country. So there's New England lobstermen, there's Chesapeake um, folks as well. Um, but it was this African American Fishery Oral History Project that got me asking these questions about the relationship between African Americans and the water. And I think it's, it's worth me just adding why I got to this in the first place. Because I'm, that introduction of me probably sounded kind of weird. Like, she's over here, she does shrimp and crabs and oysters. Okay, now she's over here, she does little people. And now she's over here, she does fishermen. Well, this is a real story. When I first moved back home to Savannah, I was always going to receptions and events, and people said, oh, you're a marine biologist, that's so awesome. You know, I want to talk to you about this, and they want to ask me about dolphins and manatees, and those are very important animals, they are. I won't stand here as a fisheries biologist for the National Marine Fisheries Service and tell you that they're not. They are very important. But I got tired of talking about them. <laughs> And I was like, wow. I mean, I just, I, I got to where I was kind of cranky. Like, I'd go to the reception, and I'd have my, you know, cocktail, and I'd, you know, I'd be, like, defensive. Like, what are you going to come over here and ask me about? Do not ask me about dolphins. <laughs> and I said, okay, you really need to be more compassionate and more proactive. And I thought, what do I want to talk about? Because after they would ask me about dolphins, they would say, how did you get interested in marine science? But you know that's not what they were asking me. They were asking, how did you get interested in marine science? And I was like, okay, now I've got to talk about being black and marine science. <laughs> and I said, okay, I know what I want to talk about. I want to talk about the fact that black people have been doing marine science for a very long time and you just don't know it. So how do I get that information? Oh, I think I'm going to do an oral history project because all this information is here. So that's my little tangent. Sorry, I hope it doesn't eat up my time. All right, so as I talk to people, here are the things that I found. One was in support of literature that was already out there, and that is that there is a form of mutual support, economic support, social support of subsistence. I have tomatoes, and we do it now. You grow too many tomatoes, what do you do? You don't throw them away. You go down the street and you give somebody the extra tomatoes. Okay? You caught more fish than you want to clean, what do you do? You go and you give somebody else some fish. That has existed for a very, very long time. That is nothing but a nature-based social subsistence system. And this cultural philosophy of sharing persists today. If you listen to the oral histories that uh, Jovan and I collected, same thing there. Um, if you want to see the words of individuals who talk about how they interacted with the environment or their feelings about the environment, you can see these that we got in Harris Neck. And Harris Neck has its own very unique um, and tragic yet ongoing story. The presence of traditional ecological knowledge there is evidenced by what you see in, in bold. So when fishing or doing whatever, they had a, fee, a season and worked within that environment and they preserved the, they, they preserved the environment. Now everything had to work in connection with each other for you to get the maximum benefits from the environment. I don't really think that they know they were envir environmentalists, but they were good at it. Community members, they're not like us. They're not sitting in a college setting. They didn't read that in a book somewhere. They knew that if you want more oysters next year, you better put the shell back. You know, they know if you want to grow this, you can't grow beans every single year. You need to rotate. Um, the way that this goes into the context of political, social, and cultural practices is that, one, the recognition of independence that comes from being able to sustain yourself, and also putting your priorities, having nature-related priorities. Money has its place, but there's something much more important than that, and that is God's creation, the things that God made. You know, if you're going to live here, these things are essential. So I move now to nature and its role in economic sustainability development. Gullah Geechee communities have persistently used nature-based expressions and occupations for economic resilience. Jonathan Green, so many, so many of his beautiful, iconic images are where? Outside, outside in nature. There are some that are not, 
But many, many of them, if you just Google some images, most of them are embracing some part of being or experiencing outside. What is more, isn't this an awesome basket? I have never seen one like that. I was just kind of playing around on Facebook um, and saw Corey Alston and this that was being exhibited at uh, the Smithsonian. What is more iconic than a sweet grass basket? You see that and you immediately think gullet culture, right? You can't have that without nature. Somebody's got to go and pick Spartina patents and bring it home and weave it into something this extraordinary. So you got to know where to get it. You got to know what conditions it needs to grow. You got to be resilient if it stopped growing where it used to grow. And that's the case for many people, as you probably read about some of the challenges of the basket makers uh, in South Carolina. And how do you take enough without completely depleting it so you keep having it's not Spartina anymore, it's Sporobolus, but Sporobolus is just not as pretty as Spartina. So I'm back to Verda May Cooks, and I want to remind you that foodways are nature-based. And there's a ex tremendous explosion. You know, first it was just kind of American food, like barbecue, stuff like that. And then we did southern foodways, and that was real popular for several years. You guys remember that. So now we're in Gullah Geechee foodways being very important, very central to economic resilience. Whether you're talking about the wonderful, wonderful Sally Ann Robinson on Defusky, or others, uh, Gina Capers in Savannah, B.J. Dennis, Mashama Bailey, um, all go back to relying on the environment um, for economic um, advancement, much like these shanty men down in McIntosh County. This is the image that I found early um, when I was doing my oral history project, and it just struck me. That image just really, I just, it, that image just was really striking to me. It resonated. Um, fishing is something that has been inherently Gullah Geechee prior to, prior to emancipation. You know, if you were in the, if you were an enslaved person in the caste system and in the task system, then that meant you had a task. You did that task. You had, I don't even want to say free time, but you had time that you could do something else. And often it was used hunting, fishing, or doing some other things that supported slave economies. There were slaves that were actually they had side hustles. You finish your task, you could do these other things, and. Um, possibly purchase your freedom with that. So these nature-based occupations persist. This is Ernest McIntosh uh, here and here, his son and their friend Nege. Um, Ev Harrisnack, he just won an award from the Southern Foodways Alliance for his work with single oysters. And I, I hope that I will have time uh, to show that video later. They are, they are a fourth generation fishing family. They used to do crab, they've moved to oysters, and they do single oysters, because when we go to a fancy restaurant and we're paying a whole lot of money for an oyster, we don't want to get cut and we don't want to fight with it. So there's a huge market in that. And so their family business has made a pivot and they're doing really, really well. And if you haven't had a Harris Neck oyster, it's extraordinary. Now, he is working with Mashama Bailey at The Gray, who won a James Beard Award for her menu uh, at, at, at her restaurant. She's now partner uh, with her friend there. Um, but again, Gullah Geechee Foodways in fine dining being recognized at a high level. So all of this, I'm in, I'm in this conversation in my head, all this is nature-based and nature-relevant. If we move into the thing that is going to help sustain communities past some of the options that we've talked about, heritage tourism is that next thing. People wanting to come and see and smell and do and eat. Um, and we, we commissioned a study to look at what the market was for heritage tourism. I've got like a 200 slide slide deck that our uh, executive director put together that I'm not showing. Uh, but know that we have lots of data to show that there's a $34 billion particular benefit to 
our region, the corridor for folks who want to travel and experience heritage tourism, and to try to help Gullah Geechee businesses and other businesses be ready for that market we have established. The corridor has established a heritage tourism alliance that meets regularly to talk about what those data look like, what that traffic looks like, and how businesses can prepare. How am I doing on time? Am I OK? OK, thank you. So now I want to frame this like a marine scientist. I'm used to thinking about natural resources that we prioritize in a geographic way. I'm used to, used to seeing a GIS map. I'm used to people saying, this is what's important, and this is how we're prioritizing it. We do that with the National Estuary Research Reserves. We see mirrors. We know what that means. We know what's supposed to be important. We know the theme of the activities that are supposed to happen there. We get it. LTER site. Somebody tells you this is an LTER site, you immediately know what's important. You know how it's been funded. You have a frame of reference for what the priority is supposed to be there. And even the same thing with the Fishery Management Council. You know who is supposed to be making sure that you're not catching crab when you're not supposed to be, or that whatever is needed to manage the snapper grouper complex down here takes place. We have a geographical re reference for this. I want to say this. What if we took what we know and we prioritize an added layer of the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor the way we prioritize the LTER, the NIR, and everything else? What if we took that same outline and said, okay, we know this falls across several LTERs. We know that there are several NIRs around here. What if we did not separate the human dimension from what we're looking at? And I show you this slide, it's a lot of the same information that you saw on the other ones, um, but this is to show you the actual outline of the area 30 miles inland. So again, I think we can do this. I think we can combine our perception, or, or at least uh, desegregate how we perceive um, that information. If we did that, we would potentially avoid the consequences of what we saw in Harris Snack when decisions are made about areas and communities and resources without engaging stakeholders. Raise your hand if you know the, Harris, the story of Harris Neck, Georgia. I know <laughs> Emily. It's good to see a friend in the back, Emily. <laughs> Emily and I used to work together at Savannah State. But basically what happened is there was some war activity off the coast of Georgia and the federal government said, oh no, we can't have this. We have to arm ourselves nearby. We need an airfield. And there were lots of other areas that were perceived to be eligible to receive an airfield, but they looked at Harris Neck and said, let's dismantle this Gullah Geechee community. It was a fishing community. We're going to put it right here. And it was marshland, so guess what? Wasn't a good idea for an airfield, was it? So then the government gave it back to the county, and the county was like, yeah, and then they did whatever with it, and the government said, no, you're not really using that well. We're going to take it back. And it ended up being in the Park Service. And the families did not receive their land back, and they did not receive fair compensation, although there's documentation that says that some families did. Some families are saying, how do you have a bill of sale that you compensated me for my land when I still have a deed? If I have a deed, you didn't buy it from me. So there's all kinds of stuff going on there. Um, and what one of the, one of the uh, descendants has said is that the way they found out is that the Secretary of Interior, there's the Harris Neck Wildlife Refu Refuge there, Secretary of the Interior came down because the refuge was established to encourage the wood stork um, to grow those populations. And the populations had hit a critical number. So it was supposed to be a feel-good story. This is going to be great. Secretary of Interior is going to come down, and this environmental uh, victory is going to be shown. And when she got there, there were people there with signs protesting, saying, we want our land back. And she was gobsmacked. It was, not, it was not a good scene. And so the conversation started about, OK, how did this happen? That doesn't happen, well, one, that, that doesn't happen when you have stakeholders at the table, and stakeholders are fully involved in processes. Um, but it's not that far in our past. So I think that there are things that work towards solutions. And I've got three suggestions based on what I've shown you and a little bit of my experience. And one is work with communities at all levels. Because there are lots of folks who are doing really extraordinary things. And there's probably someone working in an area or in a way that connects with you. 
Some of the work that's been done, particularly uh, in water topics, um, has been done by the Gullah Geechee Nation. This is a, a flyer for a conference in 2015. Um, my postdoc did a presentation there. And after that conference, they had an oyster restoration project. And people put out oyster shell. They have a ocean action plan that promotes habitat restoration. There are other partners nearby. I have to put a shameless plug in for my grad students. So these my grad students. There's Tiffany and Shanice, and well, Tiffany's finished, and Cameron and Shanice are finishing. Um, they're doing oyster, and these are um, for, two former postdocs. Um, we're doing oyster restoration. Um, we're doing it with traditional methods, and we're also using a um, biodegradable uh, 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 material called oyster, cat oyster catchers, kind of like jute. In, uh, semen impregnate, impregnated with jute, and it attracts spat very easily, and we've built several um, sites down near Brunswick uh, and uh, near Savannah. Well, there are HBCUs. We always talk about marginalized communities. We're not always defining what we mean by marginalized. Sometimes it's race, sometimes it's economic, sometimes it's rural. Um, but there are scientists at HBCUs who are doing things that are relevant to what um, many of our goals may be. So I invite you to dig a little deeper into your network, of re your, into your network, your academic network. When you mean academic, when people say academic partner, expand what you mean by academic partners. Um, South Carolina DNR uh, has a project, uh, a planting project in Maryville. Does anybody know who Maryville was named for? Some trivia. Do you want to share or you want me to tell? <laughs> okay, has, raise your hand if you've heard of Ernest Everett Just. Okay, more hands. Ernest Everett Just was the first black marine biologist. He didn't call himself a marine biologist. He was an embryologist who did his research at the Marine Biological Laboratory in Woods Hole. He's from Charleston. His mama was named Mary. His mama was feisty. And she moved out of Charleston along with some other folks and established an independent community called Maryville. This is where this project is located. So there's community activism goes way back. There are institutions like the Penn Center that have had land preservation folk programs that could be connected to. Um, on Saplow Island, this is Maurice Bailey, Maurice's Cornelia Walker Bailey's son they wrote a grant and developed an organization to help families pay back taxes. So this is their effort at land conservation to keep families from losing land over an inability to pay increased taxes. Now this is an example I want to go through quickly, but I think it connects to what you were asking of, a, of the last panel, like how do we find resources to do some of the things that we want to do because there's not enough money. So this is an initiative that was funded by a special local special local option sales tax to preserve green space in Chatham County that I was fortunate enough to participate in um, about almost 10 years ago now. So our Chatham County Commission formed a Natural Resource Protection Commission. And that Natural Resource Protection Commission worked on a list of 100 places in Chatham County that we wanted to save. So we had a room of folks, even before the commission, we had a room of folks who sat down and said, these are places that should always be green and should always be natural. That list was then provided to the commission, because that was a committee. When the special local option sales tax was passed, that committee was made into a commission. And then one representative from each district in the county was appointed to the commission and told, here's $5 million, here's the list, save all the land that you can. And that's what we endeavored to do. We started working on those properties. So these are, these are some really good people. I miss working with these people. This commission no longer exists and neither does the $5 million. Um, but we did a lot of good things. I wanna show you three examples. All right, so here's what we did. We had early stakeholder involvement because it started with people from the community getting together and telling the Metropolitan Planning Commission, here are properties that are worth saving. 
We had a committed source of funds from the special local option sales tax. It was based in a joint city county agency. So we were administered by the Metropolitan Planning Commission. We were authorized by the county commission. We had really good leadership. We had a really good county manager and supportive um, chairman of the commission. And then we had partnerships between the Army base, the Georgia Land Trust, and landowners. We also formed a technical advisory board to be science driven. So we came up with metrics that would allow us to go through a list of 100 properties. That was not just which is the cheapest property we can afford, which is the property is going to give us the greatest benefit. So we had a technical advisory board, we developed a rubric, and they would review the properties. <clears throat> they would do, we had a site evaluation team that would go out, they would use the best ecological and archaeological information available, bring it back to us, tell us about native and rare species, rare habitat. This is the procedure that I just uh, described. We had a manual, we had a team, we um, use the GIS team to assess county needs, and then working with our county manager, we purchased, we negotiated, and we took any other option that a landowner was willing to offer to be able to acquire land. The innovation was that we were highly flexible, and it resulted in us saving 3.925 kilometers of natural coastal areas that are still protected. These are still green spaces that the public uses. So these are the partners that we had but I'm going to go forward. The first one is a preserve that's on uh, Whitmarsh Island, just off of Wilmington Island. So if you've gone out to Taiba, you've driven past this preserve. It's a very pop popular hiking and recreational uh, reserve. We uh, preserve the Blue Sky property, which is further down. Like as you're passing Savannah, when you go past exit 94, you're past, there's a Cracker Barrel and Harley Davidson there. You're going past the Blue Sky, Blue Sky property. Bottomland hardwood, as well as uh, cypress, swamp. And then Pennyworth Island, which is a former rice plantation just on the other side of the Savannah River, um, uh, that, yeah, which you see, which you see here. Not available uh, for recreation except by boat. Our larger outcomes are this blue sky property that you see here. This is what I say is when you go down exit, and when you go down 95, we purchased a portion of it. We purchased a middle portion. The Georgia Land Trust helped with another portion, and Fort Stewart helped with another portion to allow us to have this contiguous corridor. So people thought we did good. We got a governor's award. And then here are the things we learned. We learned that bringing in diverse public participation early, we started with that committee, but we also had them coming in during our commission meetings. Always good to have a committed source of funds, and I told Emily that I would remember to tell you, I heard the question, where do you get the money from? How do you work with elected officials to get the resources that you need for some of these projects? A special local option sales tax is good, but I would also say East Blast. One thing I will tell you from serving on the school board is, we have an East Blast. We are using it to build new schools. Everything that you want to use that tax money for, you have to put up front. So if you want to do something green and innovative, talk to your school board, talk to whomever may be using those resources, and get it put on the list. Because those two pennies that are coming in, we're not paying that as a community. It's the tourists who come and tromp down our streets that are paying for those new schools and who can be paying for a lead design building or land conservation or whatever it is that you may be trying to do. Have a science-based process. I don't have to tell this group that. Be flexible, creative, and look for partnerships everywhere you go. We are using the infrastructure that we have in the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor to follow this 2012 plan and to inform how we move forward relative to our natural resources. And to do that, we are using stakeholders. We're using Gullah Geechee people and allies to be able to identify what should be happening in the corridor, again, within that geographic framework that I mentioned to you. And then finally, I think, I think I'm probably out of time. Well, we started a little late because everybody was slow getting in, so you can have your time. Awesome. Okay, well, this is my last thing, y'all, I promise. <laughs> this is a cool video of Ernest McIntosh, the oyster farmer that I mentioned, with his son and with James Beard Award-winning winning chef, 
Mashama Bailey. Well, I started working on the water in 1976. Had quite a few crab boats in the family. I started crabbing and working along with my father. Then I started looking at the crabbing industry, the way it's going. And my son was real interested in what he wanted to do. And I said, well, he got to have a future, you know. Y'all ready? I can't see a future into crabbing. Show us the marshes. Yeah. <laughs> but I could see it into oysters. Whenever I taste an oyster for the first time, I don't put anything on it. But I always want to taste it for the first time by itself. Yeah. It's funny, we were driving down to Florida and I was like, these days, this smells like Harris Neck oysters. <laughs> you know? It's marshy. They're marshy and funky, but they're also clean and salty at the same time. Where do they start from? What we normally look for is down here. The more the single. Well, I was practically raised on the boat. Pretty much. You know, uh, all the way throughout school, and when most kids had other little part jobs, I had a job on the boat with my dad. You know? mm -hmm. I didn't thought he was watching and listening. He was a little fellow on the boat, and I didn't know he he really picked it up. He had to dig around and find him. And uh, dad kind of wanted me to go to school and get my education, and I did that. You know, but I always end up working on the crab boat. So uh, we ended up, we kind of started out in the blind with these oysters and here we are now, you know, it's a, it's a nice, beautiful thing now, you know. Now I gotta get that mud off of them. You gotta take care of them, about like changing a diaper on a kid. Yeah. You gotta stay behind them all the time. So you have to get that mud off of them. Clean them. Wash them, keeping make sure the they're clean, off. keeping a lot of the mud off of them. Uh, you can't just leave them out here. It's like a baby. Well, they are babies. <laughs> and until they get a certain size, then it's kind of like becoming an adult. Yeah. Being a black person and having anything to do with food, you really, it's really a, a, a lot of backbone there. And I just would like to see more people of color in the room when it comes to dealing things dealing with things like farming oysters and farming in general. May, okay. It'd be nice May, to see, right, well, right. you know, actually to know how many um, <laughs> black folks are actually working in that industry. Um, how can we buy from one another? How can we support one another? Let the boat go, Mashama get it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm very much about that. This he always goes. Well, if you give me feedback, I'll listen. Just give me feedback, I'll listen. Let me hear what you got to say. He was like, "Tell me if I'm not doing the right thing. Tell me if I'm the." I said, "Okay." <laughs> well, you know, I learned that from my father. Yeah. When my father was, he didn't thought we was listening, but. When he passed on, I mean, I always, I've been working on the water since 1976. But for some reason, that that he had in him started coming out on me. Tell me if I'm not doing the right yeah. thing. And then I was like, all right. And it's funny because some people are like, well, I don't know. The cluster doesn't like, know. We're going to get it. We'll get it. It takes time, you know, you're not going to bust out the first year yeah. and get what you need. You're going to, yeah. it's going to take a few years. And I have had people, man, why don't you go for yourself? Take a chance at it. And you know, I made my mind up. I said, this is my last chance. If I can't make it now, you know I mean, what can I lose? I might as well go out trying. Thank you.
Oh, I love Claudia. Yeah. yeah. She talked about how it's, how it's so important to make sure that oftentimes, uh, I keep saying the acronym wrong, HBCUs are kind of used as like the outreach yeah. application rather than being a full fledged technical, you know, data science partner or whatever. Nobody like, thinks we do research. That's yeah, really the problem. And yeah. They need to be compensated for that as well. So, just a really important point that I like to put on what you say that you make sure that. Thank you. I really appreciate that. And I'll also add the other community that folks don't think about is the community of color of privilege. You know, all communities of color are not low wealth. We, we often gear our outreach and activities to low wealth communities. But I know some well-heeled parents that want things for their young people to do, and they can choose anything. Um, and there are organizations and communities that are stratified around interests as well as religion and, and economic uh, footing, just as there are in, in any other community. Um, and so uh, it, it is true that we have serious challenges with our public education in this region here in this state and across the border in our state. And so a lot of times you do need to target young people with deficiencies in mind. But there are also communities of color that have every resource and have every choice um, and, and can be very good partners if you know how to communicate with them. Diversity is so much broader than what we, what we see in people. Yes? Um, I'm very interested in Gullaby. Um, along with the, the plan, the management plan, um, is, are there sources of funding that will go directly to entrepreneurs, particularly African Americans from the Gullah <coughs> who have a Gullah Beach heritage, uh, that would get, provide foundation money for them to start uh, uh, eco, to start businesses or eco tourism or things that. Sure. So we have about, our annual budget this year is a million, and 500 of that comes from the Park Service, and 500 of that is from foundations. Um, so the corridor itself, so your question has, has two, the answer has two parts. There are foundations that give us extraordinarily good support. The Hyde Foundation has been wonderful to us this year. The Donnelly Foundation is extremely supportive repeatedly. They've been a partner. Um, for quite some time, and in fact, they funded the Heritage Tourism Study. They've done a lot to point us in the directions that allow us to know where we're going to be able to foster economic development. Because cultural preservation, economic development is cultural preservation. If people can pay their rent, send their kids to a good school to eat, or pay their mortgage and taxes, they can preserve their own culture. So families need to be able to take care of themselves. In that vein, we can't give away taxpayer money. We are a federal commission. So the funds that we get in through the Park Service, we can't, we can't give away. Um, there is, we have been talking for some time about setting up a grant program. There's a mechanism to do that. Many national heritage areas have friends of that national heritage area, and they can function as a foundation that allows them to do a lot of things. There are a couple of us commissioners who really want to find a way to give away money. So we have not, we haven't done it yet. But we do amplify those who are doing it. So um, PayFin on Sapelo Island is uh, actively looking at families. And you know, the development pressure on Sapelo Island is very intense um, because of that unique place, stronger than you see in some other communities. Um, so there are groups that do it. We do have relationships with foundations. Um, the, the corridor is the commission is a federal commission. The corridor we have organized as a 501c3. We just did that this year. Um, we were concerned that if the 
Act was not reauthorized, it would get rid of the commission and the corridor. Mm -hmm. So because we were concerned that that may not happen, we moved the corridor to being a 501c3 so that it would continue to exist if the act wasn't approved in March. It was, so hooray. But that also means that the corridor can do some things in the future that it wasn't able to do before we made that change this year. Thank you. Really quick. Oh, yeah. right. Just real quick. So I really appreciate the rethinking of traditional ecological knowledge. T and K could use that quite a bit in you know, ecological restoration and ecology. But I was also wondering what what's your thinking or the the um, cultural heritage thinking about how you intersect with indigenous people? And their, their sort of traditional knowledge and what they were doing um, prior to the colonization of the country. And so, yeah. Do you mean what is our historic perspective on indigenous peoples, or how do we perceive Gullah Geechee as sitting among those people yes. culturally? Okay. I'm so glad you asked that question because I've been working on that. So, um, <laughs> Well, I, I have. So, as a federal employee, remember, you know, my day job, the job that pays my mortgage, I'm a federal employee. And as a federal employee, I'm interested in communities in the Southeast that in some way engage with marine resources and fisheries. And fisheries. Um, one of the things that's come up with the recent investment in the Biden administration in social justice and, and, and equity, particularly in natural resources, is are we reaching everybody that is benefiting and using marine resources? So you have federally recognized groups, tribal groups, that you know, you have tribal liaisons, you have to check in with them on particular issues. But there are a bunch of groups that are not federally recognized, tribal and other marginalized communities like the Gullah Geechee. So there's a, there's a task force, a group of us in the Southeast region that are trying to come up with the list. The list of everyone that Noah would consider as being marginalized and then helping cast the view of how to engage those groups. Because if you just say who's on the, on the federally recognized list, you're gonna miss a lot. So. I'm sorry, I took so long. No, 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 no,